Saudi Aramco for sale at what price? The oil giant kicks off its IPO, making concessions on royalties and dividends, while valuations range from one to two trillion. Shale earnings, the not as bad, the bad, and the really bad. A rough earning season for ENPs with one company questioning its survival. And Liberia's water crisis. Millions live without clean water in a decent bathroom. We speak to Bobby Whitfield, the man in charge of fixing it. I'm Alex Steele. Welcome to Bloomberg Commodities Edge. 30 minutes focused on the companies, the physical assets, and the trading behind the hottest commodities with the smartest voices in the business. We want to kick it off with Spot On. It's our reporter take on some of the big stories, and our spotlight is on oil and uh, oil companies. Joining me now is Bloomberg's managing editor for energy and commodities, Atina Davis. Uh, one of the highlights this week was OPEC releasing their long-term report. Uh, Secretary General Mohammed Barkindo was pretty optimistic about demand, saying the picture is looking brighter at the moment, 2020 has an upside potential that may actually surprise the market. But it's not all sunshine and roses, particularly when it comes to supply. Yeah, and if you look at, at OPEC's own numbers on market share, they're predicting a drop in their share of the global oil market from 35 to 32 percent over the coming years. And that is going to be filled in primarily by U.S. shale. They've boosted their figures for what shale should be producing in the U.S. by 40 percent. Uh, so it's a big number. And again, if you're talking about OPEC, it's not simply the production of oil. It's about defending what they have in terms of market share and their ability to move prices. Right. So you take a look at, say, what they're expecting for U.S. shale. It's a tremendous increase for versus other nations, even Saudi Arabia, which just means they're going to have to keep on cutting or at some point fight for market share. What kind of color did we get from this from the report? Well, not only from the report, but also from our reporting. We have an OPEC meeting coming up December 5th and 6th. And from what we're hearing, there is not going to be a big push to deepen cuts. And in fact, what they're looking to do probably is either extend for a few months or until the rest of next year the existing production quotas they have in place, which are due to uh, expire in March. So, uh, And the other part of that is that they're really looking for the folks who had agreed to these production quotas to actually abide by them, which for everyone has, has not been the case. Certainly places like Russia and other allies have not necessarily done everything they promised to do. And there is still some question, though, if shale can grow the way that OPEC thinks. Uh, we'll hear about shale producers in just a second, but there are questions as to if they can deliver. Uh, what's going to be next? I think if you look at what's interesting is OPEC seems to be more optimistic about shale than some shale producers seem to be. Talking certainly, your books. Yeah, <laughs> certainly from what we've, <laughs> we've seen today in some of the uh, earnings calls that we listened to this week, uh, the shale pioneers and the, the, you know, the, the boys who consistently have outperformed are being much more circumspect about their ability to continue to grow at these rates. So uh, OPEC is talking about slowing growth sort of through the middle of, of the next decade, and then it starts to come down at 2029. The shale folks are saying, no, they're being even more optimistic than we would be. Uh, obviously, it's in their best interest to make it seem like there's not much shale uh, happening. Exactly. So let's get right to that. Thank you so much, Bloomberg's Tina Davis. So as Tina was just talking about, the U.S. E&Ps uh, were out. So let's get into the ring because we're focusing on the oil patch pain. You got some really bad. You got no good. You got very, very, very bad earnings season. So Chesapeake, uh, one really the epitome of America's shale gas fortunes is now warning it may not be able to outlast low fuel prices. Joining us now is Bloomberg's uh, Rachel Adams Heard in Houston, who who's been monitoring all these developments. And we just saw that the 2021 bond is now yielding 20%. Does Chesapeake actually survive? Yeah, I think that's definitely the question now. The reaction to the going concern warning the other day in the 10Q surprised me a little bit, um, just because the writing's been on the wall for this one for a while, it seems. But I think the, the declining leverage covenant really spooked a lot of investors. Um, and, you know, Chesapeake can sell off assets. That's something that they've said they're going to do. But the question is whether some of those assets, namely the Haynesville asset that they have in Louisiana that has been floated as a potential candidate for a sale, whether that can actually fetch anything at this point that would really move the needle for someone like Chesapeake that's just on the brink. Well, and let's get to that because you mentioned the 10K. So we have a quote that kind of shows that. So part of it is you have low oil and gas prices uh, hinder their ability uh, with their leverage ratios and debt covenants over the next year. And that is what's going to raise some substantial doubt about their ability uh, to actually continue and keep going. Uh, so I guess my question is, when do they have to pull the plug here? Like what other levers can they pull? This is not about their assets. This is about leverage, about selling something they may not have control over. Yeah, definitely. And I think everyone's keeping an eye on that because even like if you're a, a midstream company that you're serving Chesapeake's assets, you hope that they're able to sell something and that a producer will come in and be able to produce and fill those pipes like 
with volumes, but um, at the end of the day, that's not anything that we're able to see right now. So that's the really bad. Let's get to the guys that weren't as bad. And part of that is Pioneer. Uh, the other is EOG. So Pioneer is really the naysayer of shale's not going to go that fast. Scott Sheffield, who recently took back over for the company, said, I don't think OPEC has to worry that much about U.S. shale growth long term. He only sees about 700,000 barrels a day uh, being added next year. Easy to say, though, when you're actually doing well in the shale patch when everyone else is struggling. Definitely, yeah. Pioneer is someone who's come out and cut their uh, spending guidance again, um, and that's something that investors have said that they wanted. Uh, but what's happened is a lot of companies cut their spending guidance, but then had to creep up above that, or they weren't able to meet their uh, production targets. So I think when you're someone like Scott Sheffield, you're really trying to raise the alarm to the fact that you're doing this right when everyone else seems to be struggling to do that, especially when you have a week where a name like Diamondback, another you know darling of the Permian Pure plays, had such a struggle. Yeah, I like that you brought up Diamondback uh, because they were one of the, you got Pioneer, you got EOG, Diamondback. Those are the ones that everybody loved, but they had some operational issues versus EOG also showed like, this is how you do it. You cut spending and you increase production. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, in the long run, those will probably be the companies that are rewarded. Whether Diamondback, you know, they're saying that they're going to be able to come back from this, that this was a um, one-time thing, that they had a nearby operator who was fracking for too long and that that uh, interrupted some of their volumes. But they're also saying, hey, guys, we're going to have to bring down what we're expecting in terms of our oil cut. Um, and that even though analysts said that they were going into it with low expectations and that they were expecting a guide down, the, the size of the miss really seemed to surprise everyone. All right, Bloomberg's Rachel Adams heard. Thank you so much. Really great to get your perspective. And it's time now for the note of the week. And it comes to us from Ed Morissette City, and he's commenting on U.S. shale. So he says, overall, if history is a guide, this could be a period of low prices, low R&D, industry consolidation with curtailed spending by the international oil companies and the national oil companies and independence and structural change ahead. So a big morning there uh, for the shale patch. And as we head to break here, PG&E reported a $1.6 billion loss for the third quarter and is fighting for its survival. Some distressed investors say they can understand the value. I have to tell you as a distressed investor, it is actually pretty rare that you manage to buy a utility company in an oligopolistic market inside of eight times EV to EBITDA, right? And this is what's happening here. I'm Alex Steele. This is Bloomberg Commodities Edge. A uh, time now for the data dig. We delve deep into the trends of the week. So first up, you get oil inventories. The big surprise was the huge build we saw in crude, almost 8 million barrels for the week. Analysts had expected a much modest build, and part of that making matters worse is you had the large, a very large drop in exports. And the diamond industry has a different kind of cut in mind, and that's called price cuts. So De Beers is slashing prices by 5% across the board for the first time in years as sales, you can see here, really slump. The goal is while sales are slumping to improve profits for some of the middlemen. And the shutdown of one of Canada's largest crude pipelines, Keystone, has now caused some distortions in the market. So refiners are now buying Bakken oil by train to replace light Canadian grades, and that's increased the price differential uh, between Bakken and other oil prices. We want to stay with oil and turn to Saudi Aramco. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman wants a $2 trillion valuation. He may take 1.6, while the street is as low as $1 trillion. We want to turn now to Anish Kapadia, policy advisors uh, also joining us uh, in London. So, Anish, you're one of the more pessimistic with a $1 trillion valuation. Why so low? What do you see? Good afternoon. We at Policy Advisors have done a very detailed analysis of Saudi Aramco. We built our own proprietary model and looked at it both on a bottom-up valuation basis and also a comparative basis versus the other key uh, uh, large-cap oil and gas companies, the super majors, the national oil companies. And when we look at it in both of those ways, we see a base case valuation of around a, a trillion dollars. Um, so looking at it um, based on a $60 oil price long term, um, a 10% discount rate, we get to around that trillion dollar valuation. If you look at it on financial metrics, um, such as cash flow metrics, we also think relative to peers around a trillion dollar valuation is fair 
from a market perspective. Well, we saw some concessions that came in. Part of it's lowering the royalties to the government. Part of it is trying to entice retail investors to come in. Is there anything that then Saudi Aramco can do on a concession basis to sort of up your valuation? Business. So I think Saudi has um, made, made the investment case more friendly to international investors by um, reducing the royalties. Um, also, it's taken down some tax rates for, for certain business lines. Um, I think also in terms of the retail investors, it's uh, giving some bonus shares to them. It's probably helping out in terms of uh, giving them uh, bank credit to buy, buy the shares. So I think there's a way that um, Saudi Aramco can uh, get a higher valuation, certainly in the domestic market, um, by, by creating a limited amount of supply. So part of that's the dividend. And if you take a look at, say, how its dividend uh, at a $1.6 trillion uh, dollar valuation stacks up uh, to other oil uh, companies, it's still but 4.7%. That really pales in comparison to other names like, say, Exxon. Um, what's your confidence in the ability for them to continue holding on to that dividend if oil prices, say, go below 50 or near 50? Well, it's interesting. When, when you look at the dividend for Saudi Aramco, I think that's the the main thing that they've put out there to try and entice the international investors. It, it is a, it's a high dividend uh, when you think about the yield at, um, at a lower valuation, um, but the valuation that they're going for, um, as you say, it, it actually is a lower yield than some of the super majors, some of the other national oil companies. And, and, and also, it's paying out virtually all its cash flow mm. in dividends, whereas other companies have got cash flow left over for buybacks or um, deploying that cash flow elsewhere. It, it, to, to grow that dividend, you really need to see higher oil prices or higher production. So you need to take a bet on that to um, see higher dividends in the future. Uh, and then to round it out, uh, we hear Bloomberg broke this week that perhaps uh, Chinese companies were going to be interested, pension funds were going to be interested. Uh, what do you make of that and the potential for, say, Russia to also buy into this IPO? Well, I think it makes a lot of sense for the Saudi government to want to get some of the um, large oil producing governments or national oil companies to invest in the company. Um, because what you're seeing is Saudi Aramco investing in downstream projects in a lot of those countries, in um, China, for example, in India, in, in the Far East. And I think what the government then expects in return is that those, some of those um, national oil companies or those governments will put money into the Aramco IPO and try and support a higher valuation. Uh, all right. It was a great perspective. Thank you very much. No doubt we'll be talking to you again. Anish Kapadia of Policy uh, Advisors. And Aramco might actually want to take the note of the failed auction we saw in Brazil this week. That sent the real tumbling after Petrobras fell the most in a while. You had a lot of the teams in China bidding up some of the block with Petrobras, but two others were actually unsold. ExxonMobil and other oil majors didn't actually bid. So the why? Maybe it's Brazil. Maybe it's the economy, maybe it's shareholders demanding investment discipline, or maybe it's something more ominous, that oil has entered its twilight years. And like the Saudis, Brazil has to rely on the Chinese. Gives you something to think about. All right, coming up, Bobby Whitfield, a chairman and CEO of Liberia National Water Sanitation Hygiene Commission, talks about how he's aiming to solve the country's water crisis. More on Bloomberg Commodities Edge. I'm Alex Steele. This is Bloomberg Commodities Edge. A time now for BNF Brief, which gives in-depth analysis on clean energy, advanced transport, commodities, and emerging technologies. Uh, today, we're focusing on big tech. So Google employees asked management to ditch deals with oil and gas companies. One engineer said, if Google is going to confront its share of responsibility for the climate crisis, that means not helping oil and gas companies extract fossil fuels. This is a moment in history that requires urgent and decisive action. Joining me now is Kyle Harrison from Bloomberg NEF. Um, so, Kyle, that's a very binary view to look at it. What is big tech actually doing in their own climate change uh, pursuit? Yeah, so big tech buys a lot of clean energy, more than any other industry. And the big driver of this is the uh, high energy demand of these companies. 
Uh, so a lot of these big tech companies are building really power intensive data centers. Um, and compared to other companies that as a result, again, they have much higher power demand. Um, so for these companies to actually go ahead and, ahead and hit their goals, it means they need to buy a lot of solar and wind moving forward. Right, because a lot of them have like zero, uh, zero CO2, zero emissions, only clean energy 100% in like years. And some of them have already hit it, like Google and like Apple. Exactly, yeah. So Google is one of those companies that in 2017 and 2018, they purchased enough solar and wind to actually meet their global annual electricity demand with clean energy. The challenge for a company like Google, and I think this goes back to what I was saying earlier, mm -hmm. is that their electricity demand continues to grow. So from 2010 to 2018, Google's electricity demand went up 450%. Wow. So moving forward, as they continue to build data centers and uh, continue to increase their demand, they're going to need to sign a lot more solar and wind deals. Are, are there enough solar and wind deals out there? Yeah. What no. does a lot mean? <laughs> right now, supply and demand are pretty even. If a company wants to go ahead and buy clean energy, there is a clean energy supplier or developer that is going to go out there and sell a project to them. Um, so right now, the market continues to grow, and tech is really leading in that regard. Uh, do we have to worry about things? Well, I guess a, a better question is, how much money are they going to have to put into this to sort of uh, c keep up with their energy consumption? Right. Well, uh, the cost for clean energy continues to go down. Mm. So those prices that Google and Apple and Facebook are able to access when signing these deals are a lot cheaper than they were a couple of years ago. So that cost continues to go down. but. Like we just talked about, as demand goes up and they need to continue to sign deals, this is going to be a huge investment for Google and other tech companies. Kyle, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Kyle Harrison of Bloomberg NEF. Now let's turn to Commodity in Chief, where we focus on one executive in the commodity world. And today it's Bobby Whitfield, head of Liberia's National Water Sanitation Hygiene Commission. First, we want to take a closer look at the challenges that he's facing. Liberia has a water crisis. In a population of 4.5 million people, 3.7 don't have a decent toilet, 3 in 10 don't have clean water, and over 700 children under 5 die a year from diarrhea. Two civil wars have devastated the country and wiped out infrastructure, forcing it to take a giant step back in clean water and sanitation. Some hope that's about to change. Enter Bobby Whitfield, head of WASH, National Water Sanitation and Hygiene Commission. It has four goals, manage, expand, and sustain services, increase access to environmental, sustainable water and sanitation services, manage systems and step up monitoring, and improve sector financing. Liberia cannot do it alone. It needs company money coupled with private funds. And the goal is to save Liberia and also become a commodity hub, exporting water all over the region and into landlocked countries. A big job with big risk. I recently caught up with Bobby Whitfield and I asked him how he plans to address all of these issues. Cost Liberia almost 17 you know, million dollars in the economy just by not having safe drinking water in the country. What does success look like in that metric? Look, uh, uh, open defecation is a major challenge. So we got about 64% uh, of our population stay practicing open, open defecation. Wow. We're crafting the roadmap to end open defecation in the country. Mm -hmm. So by you know, within the next five years, we should make open defecation history in Liberia. And this is where we are calling on our development partners, but as well as investors, people to bring in new, you know, innovative solutions. So in your models, when you sort of look out, how much is all of this going to cost you? Look, uh, according to our sector investment plan, Liberia would need no less than $155 million per annum from now to 2020, I mean 2030 in the past two, three, four years. Uh, the stats shows that we've been in investing, that is uh, all of our NGOs and development partners and government contribution together, we've been investing a uh, little on, uh, you know, four to four million dollars. So we are really, really short. So you have a big shortfall. Who makes that up? Well, the shot for, uh, as we speak, government is coming up to the challenge a bit uh, slowly, but our, our economic uh, is also a serious challenge, the economy, and, and we got a lot of priorities as government. Tapping into the private-public partnership. So we are looking at investors to come into Liberia. We want to attract investors into, you know, the country and look at how we... Um, a look at water in a different way. Water is a commodity. Apart from being a human right, it's also a commodity. The technology of piping water, uh, piping oil and gas already exists, you know. Why can't we look at that innovation for the water sector and start to pipe water into countries that are seriously, you know, uh, facing drought and water stress? How's that going? 
Look, uh, our, our it's, 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 uh, those are those are ideas that we are still throwing about. Those are things that we are still thinking about. But uh, first and foremost, we want to make sure that we got basic coverage water throughout the republic. No one is left behind. And then you look at uh, maybe exporting water as a, as a right. nation. But what about how, what are you doing to entice private companies to come in? Look, what we've been doing so far is uh, basically in the, in the regulatory cycle, we've been introducing ourselves, defining our roles as mm -hmm. a new commission. Uh, and, and part of that is uh, a lot of uh, visibility, advocacy, you know, or promotions and what have you. So um, the next uh, uh, phase of the regulatory cycle is where we really do data collection. We want to make sure that we get the data accurate when we are reporting about Liberia, you know, water coverage and all of this stuff. So data collection, information management, sharing. And then the next stage is where we, you know, actually do monitoring evaluation. So monitoring evaluation as part of the regulatory functions is very important for government because if we want to, you know, uh, measure the work being done by some of the NGOs in the partners or businesses in the, the sector, uh, the, through our monitoring evaluation, we can get that done. But, but you mentioned that water is a commodity. Yeah. What can you do around that thesis to help bring more money in, like ways to sell it to other countries or something along those lines? Look, water, water is the next oil or gold. Water is the next big thing. And I think uh, Liberia, as a water-rich country, uh, should be taken into serious consideration. A lot of uh, manufacturing industry in the, in the West are uh, I, I, I having issues in terms of their water consumption and water usage and and and, and I, I read a story somewhere where you know water is struck into a factory just to manufacture textile and I say wow if this was Liberia you wouldn't be trucking water you can just get water off the ground so we are looking at our investors uh, thinking outside of the square now or outside of the box now and looking at countries like Liberia with so much water to see what how do you move some of the manufacturing industry into Liberia that was my interview with Bobby Whitfield, head of Liberia's National Water Sanitation and Hygiene Commission. So residents in China are sporting something rarely seen before in the country, milk mustaches. Growth may be slowing the world's second largest economy, but the country's citizens are consuming more dairy in the form of baked goods and beverages like spring rolls and rice balls. That's causing milk prices to become a whole lot richer all around the world. Here's what's on my commodity radar. So Monday, you have Adipec conference that starts in Dubai, lasts through Thursday. Lots of heavy hitters are going to be there. And on Wednesday, International Energy Agency publishes its World Energy Outlook. It's an annual forecast. Don't miss that. That wraps it up for Bloomberg Commodities Edge. This is Bloomberg.